Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we have 29 participants, so I think we can get going. My name is James Baker. I am the uh, Senior Circular Economy Specialist with ADB. Um, this is our 22nd Circular Economy, Economy webinar and our first of 2024, so exciting times. Today, we are gonna be talking about bioplastics, and this is an emergent area of both research and investment for ADB and globally. Uh, we identified this as a challenge, as an area where we needed greater and more in-depth study last year. And we've been very fortunate to be supported by Dr. Pierre Kurdlap and Kate Jarvis, who are working with us on this project. For today's webinar, we are gonna have a presentation by Pia, um, who undertook this study. And then we will have a, a discussion, question and answer supported with Kate and Pia towards the end of the hour. It's a very exciting opportunity. Pia is an excellent research um, scientist, very skilled manager and a, a personal friend. I'm very pleased that he's done this work for us and it has done, turned out to be a fantastic um, policy brief, a fantastic set of information and it has been very well received both within ADB and our partner countries. Kate has been working with ADB for a long time um, and is part of our private sector team and um, contributes a huge amount to our work on bioplastics, our investments, and also specializes in asking me difficult questions. Um, so it is my opportunity now to, to throw that back at her later. But let's get started. So Pierre, please uh, take us into your presentation. We look forward to it. Um, I will remind all our participants that you may ask questions in the chat at any time, and we will cover those later in the question and answer discussion. Um, or you can hold them and, and, and raise your hand during that discussion. Uh, so thank you very much, Pierre. Off we go. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, James, for the really very uh, kind and warm welcome. Um, I'm really excited uh, today to be on this webinar, mainly because this webinar kind of represents um, that motion of closing the back cover of a book. And the book being this study uh, we undertook with ADB. Um, and I had the opportunity to lead this study with a great team of uh, consultants who specialize in different aspects of the bioplastic value chain. And so today, my goal is to provide a multidimensional uh, view of bioplastics um, across the value chain um, with a focus on Thailand and some of the implications uh, for the industry in Southeast Asia. And so um, there's a lot of different perspectives um, and also information that's uh, out there. We were able to look at different aspects such as uh, environmental impacts, financial analysis, and look at the social uh, aspects as well. And so that inspired the title today, Perceptions versus Reality and Future Directions for Southeast Asia. So let's get started. So what are bioplastics? Bioplastics are plastic materials made of substances that are derived from biomass materials and or can be broken down by microorganisms through processes that occur naturally in the environment or technologically enhanced natural processes. Uh, what we mean by technologically enhanced natural processes are, for example, at an industrial composting facility. So an industrial composting facility has equipment that is uh, enhancing the natural process of decomposition and biodegradation. Now, there's a lot of different bioplastic materials out there, and it's very easy for people to lump all material, bioplastic materials as the same. But actually, um, there are many different types of bioplastics uh, based on where they, whether they come from natural materials or um, non-natural materials, or whether they can be uh, biodegradable in the environment. And so this picture here shows how we classify different types of bioplastics, whether um, they are non-biodegradable or biodegradable, and whether they're made from petrochemical raw materials or renewable raw materials. Um, so just for some examples, uh, polylactic acid, this is quite a common bioplastic. And this one um, is made from uh, biomaterials and it is also biodegradable in the environment. Whereas other bioplastics such as bio-based uh, PE or PET, which is used in our uh, water bottles, um, this means this type of material, it is made from um, biomaterials, but it is not degradable naturally in the environment. Um, bio -PET, um, it actually has the same chemical 
um, uh, structure as PET, but it just gets its material from um, crops and other bio-based materials um, instead of petrochemicals. Now, with all these different types of materials, um, there's a lot of different perspectives um, uh, from different consumers and how they use these bioplastics. So we have those uh, positive, more uh, supportive of bioplastics. And the key reasons that people cite are that bioplastics, they reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They can be an alternative to single use plastics and they help increase the, raw, the value of raw material of uh, agricultural products. There's also the other side that is not necessarily supportive of bioplastics, uh, saying that it has no uh, value in the recycling market. And bioplastics are almost impossible to differentiate from petrochemicals as they can look and feel identical and can contaminate recycling streams. And they may not necessarily, uh, and they do not um, solve the single uh, use plastic issue. Okay. Now we have the other side is that's a bit uncertain about where people stand on bioplastics. So, um, you know, and these people who are around the middle, um, they say that um, certain conditions um, do allow bioplastics to be beneficial in the environment, but not at the current state of the technology. And also the benefits of bioplastics also depends on how the waste management pathway uh, is, is uh, <clears throat> implemented and whether uh, they are separated from recycling streams or not. And so these different uh, perceptions um, of bioplastics actually influence policy, um, both uh, around the world and also here in Southeast Asia. If we look at uh, bioplastic policies around the world, um, there's uh, the promotion policies. And so we see these promotion policies in Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, uh, Republic of Korea, and the United States. And these type of policies have been setting targets for a percentage of bioplastic to be used in the country by a certain year. Um, similarly, these policies also encourage that bioplastics be composted, sorted, and recycled, uh, go through anaerobic digestion or incineration with energy recovery in order to ensure that they are properly managed on the waste management side. Now, there are also bans on bioplastics, and we've seen some of these bans in Australia, France, uh, the People's Republic of China, and in Taipei. And one ex uh, a few examples is uh, <clears throat> in the National Plastics Plan of uh, 2021 in Australia, um, there is a goal to phase out problematic bioplastics that are not certified or are misleading regarding their ability to biodegrade. Um, in France, the food uh, agency has recommended um, that a home compostable plastics ban because the degradation is actually less likely to take place at home composters and can actually release more contaminants into the environment. Now, here in Southeast Asia, <clears throat> um, there are uh, several countries that have implemented policies related to bioplastics uh, to certain levels of ambition. Um, so in Cambodia, for example, um, the country has promoted biodegradable plastics and a public uh, plastic bag reduction. Uh, in Indonesia, there were uh, industry standards uh, for bioplastic shopping bags. Um, in Malaysia, there were um, eco-labeling criteria that established. And in the Philippines, at the city level, there have been uh, laws and policies that are focused on clearly labeling the different types of bioplastics, whether they are oxo-biodegradable or degradable, and they should be printed on a coating system. Um, in Thailand, we see more um, promotion in the production of bioplastics. So we were able to see how there are both non-tax and tax incentives uh, for activities related to the bioplastic industry, um, any type of eco-friendly chemicals or eco-friendly products. And so with all these different policies, um, activities going on uh, both around the world and in Southeast Asia, there is a clear interest to understand uh, what are the costs and benefits of bioplastics. And this initiated the study um, that was led by ADB and in partnership with the Pollution Control Department of Thailand and also with the Thai Bioplastics Industry Association. Um, the objectives of this study were to measure the costs and benefits of bioplastics in Thailand versus petrochemical plastics and understand the key factors that drive the costs and benefits. And when I say costs and benefits, I'm referring to both financial, environmental, and economic costs and benefits. Um, in terms of the study outputs, uh, we did a life cycle assessment uh, to measure the environmental impacts of different types of bioplastics versus petrochemical plastics. We measured the financial and economic performance of bioplastics versus petrochemical plastics. We also conducted a stakeholder engagement workshop where we shared some preliminary findings to um, bioplastic uh, value chain stakeholders uh, in Bangkok. And this was done in April of last year. 
Um, and through the research, we were able to produce a bioplastic industry improvement strategy. We also reviewed uh, bioplastic industry and policies in uh, ASEAN countries. So looking at what's their current capacity for production, uh, producing different types of bioplastics and where the policies that uh, support or do not support uh, this industry. And finally, all of this was uh, put into a bioplastics policy brief that I'll talk about later on in this presentation. And in terms of the scope of the bioplastics look at, we uh, looked at six different types of bioplastics. So we have polylactic acid, uh, PBS, uh, thermoplastic starch, and some bio-based uh, polyethylene and, and uh, PET. And the feedstocks that were included in this analysis uh, were the ones that are primarily used in Thailand. So we have sugar cane and cassava, and uh, we did some analysis on agri-waste. So specifically uh, sugar cane bagasse, that's the waste that's left after you extract the sugar from the sugar cane and also rice husk, where um, the waste that remains after you extract the rice out. Now, I just do wanna give everyone a little bit of context in the um, bioplastics industry. So Thailand is actually ranked as the second largest manufacturer of bioplastics in the world, uh, with USA being the, uh, the largest in the world. And currently 90% of bioplastic resins that are manufactured in Thailand are actually exported. Uh, to the countries that you can see on the right side of this uh, slide. And only 10% are consumed domestically. Um, the key producers in Thailand are Total Corbion and uh, PTT MCC. And uh, the feedstocks currently uh, mostly come from sugarcane and cassava. But uh, actually less than 1% of Thailand's sugarcane and cassava is used for the production of bioplastics, where the rest is used for uh, mainly food, uh, both domestic consumption and also exports. Uh, during this project, we had the opportunity to engage with uh, many different stakeholders who are involved in bioplastics and also petrochemical plastics. And in this workshop, we brought together 60 participants um, and 70% of them were from the private sector and other participants, including uh, governments uh, and nonprofit organizations um, and development agencies. And what was great about this workshop was that for the first time, we brought together the majority of Thailand's bioplastics industry stakeholders in the same room for cross-cutting discussions. And one of the, the key uh, interesting uh, things that came out of this workshop were the variety of opinions regarding bioplastics because you had people who were involved on the waste management side and also people on the production side. There are conflicting interests and in trying to see uh, where there is alignment. And one of the key things that everyone did agree upon was the need for composting facilities um, at the industrial scale in time if uh, bioplastic uh, production uh, is to increase and waste management needs to be implemented. We also were able to engage uh, with the pollution control department uh, quite actively in uh, showing what were the findings from our study and how could they be used in policy making in um, pollution control, but also in bioplastics production and where to look at uh, for the future of this industry. So I'll share with you right now some of the key findings from this cost benefit analysis. So in terms of environmental impacts, um, our research showed that bio, most bioplastics have lower greenhouse gas emissions than fossil and fossil fuel use than petrochemic, uh, petrochemical plastics. That is, uh, sh uh, uh, has been shown in other studies, but also through our own analysis and the data we gathered from the life cycle assessment, we, uh, we also found this uh, same finding. Um, but our also, research also showed that bioplastics do have higher impacts compared to petrochemical plastics in terms of impacts to eutrophication, terrestrial acidification, uh, particular matter emissions, water use, and agricultural land use. And the main reason for this was um, in the farming and feedstock production activities, this is, was um, for bioplastics made up the largest share of these impacts to particulate matter emissions, water use, and agricultural land use um, for obvious uh, reasons, but mainly due to the, the, the um, emissions of particulate matter from uh, harvesting, um, water use from growing the crops, and just agricultural land use to actually make the crops. Um, what we also found was that waste management of biodegradable plastics actually significantly influences the GHG emissions. Um, GHG emissions during biodegradation can really vary depending upon how much carbon in the bioplastic resin is converted into carbon dioxide versus methane. Um, and so this diagram here on the bottom shows uh, what happens uh, when we um, produce bioplastics and they get uh, sent into the environment. And so the benefit that people uh, always say that bioplastics are biodegradable. Um, they're not left uh, in the ocean, they can break apart. But with biodegradation, this also means that you release greenhouse gases 
And whether um, you release uh, more carbon dioxide or methane really depends on what conditions you have. So if you uh, put the uh, biodegradable plastic in a landfill, you'll have more methane produced. Whereas, like, whereas if you put the bioplastic in the industrial composting facility, um, there's less methane that's produced and more CO2, which is uh, better in terms of greenhouse gas emissions at the end of life. And finally, what we also found was that uh, using agri-waste and converting them directly into uh, bioplastic uh, chemicals and materials um, can actually result in higher energy demand uh, during because of the conversion process. And so that can actually result in more greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it, it should be cautioned that the data we use um, was uh, based on lab scale uh, conversion of um, the sugarcane bagasse and also rice cuss into bioplastic materials and such. But there could be other businesses out there that are maybe at a larger scale or have found other ways to convert uh, bioplastic, uh, sorry, biomaterial, bio based uh, materials into, uh, sorry, bioplastic waste into the bioplastics. Uh, and that could have actually lower impacts. Um, but this is just based on the data that was publicly available and we were able to review so far. In terms of the financial costs, um, our, the research we did are showed that bioplastic resins are more expensive than petrochemical plastics, uh, with petrochemical plastics ranging from around um, uh, $0.4 to uh, $0.6 per kilogram of resin. Whereas if you look at bioplastics, um, these are much more expensive. You can, um, you, these are typically going for between 2 to $7 per uh, kilogram of resin produced. Um, in terms of profitability, um, based on the data we had access to for uh, polylactic acid and PBS in Thailand, uh, bioplastics can be a profitable investment, uh, mainly because of the higher prices uh, you can sell them at. And um, based on our estimates, you can recover the investment cost within 10 to 12 years. And this has also been estimated by other companies um, who we were able to uh, speak with as well. Um, one of the uh, things we found out was that um, the competitive competitiveness of bioplastics versus petrochemical plastic, it really depends on how well the oil and gas markets are um, doing. Um, and this is a, um, this really affects whether um, by factors such as um, cost of extraction and production of um, petrochemical plastics and oil and also political events and crises. And so really depending on how the oil markets are doing, bioplastics can do better or worse from a financial and economic perspective. Um, one thing to consider um, is that um, with bioplastics, since all the raw materials are produced in Thailand, um, in the event there's a future situation where the oil and gas markets are not doing well and uh, petrochemical plastics are much more expensive to uh, import or produce, um, Thailand could rely on its own domestic resources to meet uh, the demand for certain plastic materials. Now, in terms of waste management, um, two key things to, to know is that with biodegradation, um, the speed of biodegradation uh, varies depending on what type of environment you're in. So you can see here on the graph on the left side that uh, in a, it depends on the temperature of the environment, also microbial biomass that's available. And so with industrial composting facilities, those are the ideal um, conditions for biodegradation. So that's why uh, it's the fastest. Uh, whereas like in the freshwater or marine environment, the biodegradation is going to be much more slower. Now, in terms of recyclability, um, there are challenges when mixing in biodegradable um, or compostable bioplastics in recycling stream. Um, currently, they are incompatible with traditional mechanical recycling uh, technologies. And what uh, has been shown through research and also in practice is that um, there's a higher loss rate of recyclable plastics when you mix in biodegradable plastics into the waste stream and such. And so, and also when you have the, um, when these, uh, these bioplastics are mixed in, this can actually um, affect the quality or the properties of the recycled plastic that is actually produced. So what do we do? How do we look ahead in, in terms of this industry? Well, the thing is to, to consider is that we have to look across the entire value chain from um, feedstock uh, production, manufacturing, consumption, and uh, waste management. And so when we look at feedstock production, some key things to do to improve the bioplastics industry is to uh, contribute to agricultural sector reform. And this is really talking about how do we make farming practices much better and make them more sustainable? Because um, it's easy to look at bioplastics and say, oh, this is the only issue that matters. But actually, a lot of uh, products that we consume on a day-to-day -day basis rely on agricultural feedstocks. 
And so this is an opportunity to uh, look at uh, agricultural sector reform to improve the practices. Um, in Thailand, uh, there's a, a big uh, policy initiative called the Biocircular Green Economy. And there's a lot of excitement for this, but with that, mainly because Thailand could use its agricultural resources. But there's been a lack of a discussion about how do we actually improve these agricultural practices that would fuel a biocircular green economy. Um, PM 2.5, that's a huge issue right now in the news and stuff. And a lot of that comes from agricultural practices. And so looking at um, uh, reforming the agricultural sector is a key component um, for bioplastics, but also a lot of agricultural products. When we look at manufacturing, if we want to reduce the environmental impacts of bioplastics, um, you know, there needs to be um, exploration of performance-based financial incentives for manufacturers. Right now, manufacturers um, in bioplastics, um, the cost of production are high, and there's not a lot of incentive for them to look down further upstream in supply chain to make these improvements that would reduce environmental impacts. Um, and so other aspects to consider are uh, using more clean energy at resin manufacturing facilities because there's a lot of energy that's used to convert the, um, the bio-based materials into the plastics. And also looking at how do we improve the agri-waste to bioplastic or biomaterial conversion technology. As I mentioned before, um, based on our analysis and the data we had access to, the um, conversion of agri-waste to um, biomaterial through traditional polymerization processes consumes a lot of energy. And so there's new uh, technologies or innovations that could improve that and reduce energy consumption. That would be really interesting to explore to use agri-waste as opposed to food crops. In terms of consumption, um, there is a need to identify applications where bioplastic can target specific problems. Um, because if we just use bioplastic to replace single-use plastics, we're not necessarily addressing the whole plastic pollution uh, uh, problem. But there are certain applications where bioplastics could be really useful. So for example, um, in certain parts of Thailand in mountainous regions, there is some agricultural activity and there's a need for uh, plastic mulch films. And it's very hard to bring the plastic waste down the mountain and such. Right? And so bioplastics that are degradable would be a great application for this uh, specific use case and, and such. And so we can identify these specific applications that would be really beneficial um, for just the bioplastic industry, but also targeting specific problems and make them have a real value for um, the environment and the economy. And finally, in terms of waste management, there needs to be an investment in infrastructure to manage the organic waste streams. This is something that is just lacking in Thailand and a lot of other Southeast Asian countries in general, which is responsible for a lot of methane emissions from food waste. Um, there's also need to do more institutional coordination in waste management. So one example in Thailand is that um, the policies uh, for waste management are made by one uh, agency in the government, but the actual financing and the funding actually uh, is decided on another in another agency. And so there needs to be more alignment to actually make this process uh, more seamless so that you can actually have uh, waste management infrastructure at a much faster rate. And so um, you know, today's presentation, I, you know, I kept it pretty brief, but tried to uh, highlight the key points. But if you wanna learn more, there is a policy brief that our team was able to produce uh, about bioplastics, uh, where it serves as a guide for navigating this complex landscape. Uh, you'll get a 101 introduction to different types of bioplastics and also reviews uh, the policies and waste management challenges of this bioplastic. And if you just Google, um, ADB bioplastic, it should come up in your search uh, and it can be downloaded for free. So I want to thank you all for your time today for learning about bioplastics. Um, none of this research would have been possible without the support of the Asian Development Bank, the Pollution Control Department of Thailand, and also the Thai Bioplastic Industry Association. Um, my email is at the bottom if you have any other questions, but I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A session and also uh, the discussion with uh, the other members here in the webinar. Thank you. Excellent, Pierre. Thank you very much for that run through. Um, exciting subject area, um, developing subject area, still very complex, still a lot of questions to be asked. Um, to help us put a little bit more um, color on ADB's role and how we are seeing the uh, world of bioplastics develop, we're very fortunate today to be joined by Kate Jarvis, one of my colleagues. Um, there she is. Hello, Kate. And um, James, hi, Pia. I was just, Kate, can you help us with a little bit of, um, I think, color, a little bit of context on the bioplastics? Um, so, yeah, what examples have you seen implemented in develop, you know, in the developing countries in Asia, 
that improve the way crop and feedstocks are grown or harvested, um, you know, regenerative agriculture opportunities, um, and also sort of that, that balance between you know, food supply, security, and bioplastics. Is it, could you give us a little bit of color on that? Sure, I'll try. Thanks, James. It's a great question. And thank you, Pia, for an excellent um, presentation and introduction. So Pia mentioned a few issues, and I'll touch on a few of them, and then um, that will, I think, lead into a discussion about regenerative agriculture. So, so Pia mentioned particulate matter emissions, and that's um, largely linked to the burning of agricultural residues. Um, and that's really an issue as well as the um, particulate matter emissions, the CO2 emissions, burning residues is really detrimental to soil health. It's a traditional practice in many developing countries um, and it can be avoided when the harvesting can become mechanised. Um, so when the harvesting is mechanised, it means that stubble can be chopped and spread behind the header or alternatively it could be mulched after a harvest. Um, there are alternatives as well. So the residues could be potentially used um, for animal feed or for energy production instead of being burned. Um, and I think Pierre even mentioned that there might be opportunities to include agricultural waste as potential feedstocks for the bioplastics themselves, which I think is really exciting. So there's a lot of kind of um, work to be done there to help farmers transition away from, from burning their crop residues. Um, Pierre also mentioned eutrophication and that for people that are not familiar with the term, that's when there's um, excess nitrogen that um, arrives in the waterways um, that depletes the oxygen in the waterways and can um, and can be very very detrimental to the marine life or the um, the fish health in um, in those rivers and and ocean systems, um, and that really comes from the over application of fertilizers. So when fertilizers are applied. Um, in an, 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 you know, not judiciously, I would say, or not efficiently, um, you have this issue of potentially eutrophication from the runoff of that excess fertilizer. So it's not um, completely absorbed by the soil and so it runs off into the waterways. But also um, that's contributing to nitrous oxide and methane emissions from the, um, the fertilizers once they're applied, as well as higher emissions associated with the production of the fertilizers, which are then wasted. Um, and then the other issue that Pia mentioned was um, high land and water use. So on the water use, it's really important to encourage farmers to adopt the most efficient um, irrigation systems that they can. Typically, that's drip irrigation, um, although that might be more expensive than uh, alternative irrigation techniques. So um, making sure that that is financially viable for farmers is an important question. Um, on the land use, that is partly an issue of agricultural productivity. So finding ways to sustainably increase productivity is really important. Um, and I, I guess that takes me to um, a topic that I we would we would call kind of regenerative agriculture. But how do we um, help farmers improve these practices and sustainably in, increase their productivity? So we we hosted a client event in Singapore in November that included a panel discussion on regenerative agriculture. Um, it's a very broad topic. There's no universally accepted definition of the term, but we can consider it to be a collection of practices that aim to sustain soil health and prevent degradation, conserve water resources, um, promote and sustain biodiversity, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and potentially sequester carbon, um, and then to your point, James, improve farmer livelihoods and by providing better productivity and enhance food security. Um, so getting a little bit more detailed, if I may, on um, on what are you know the, the feedstocks most likely used for bioplastics production in Asia at the moment and on sugarcane, uh, we were very fortunate to have um, a panelist who was the head of agriculture at TTC Agri S, which is the largest sugar company in Vietnam. Um, like many of our private sector agribusiness clients, TTC AgriS uses a contract farming model and it provides extension services and advice 
to its farmers. So it has a really large team of agronomists. And I'll just bring up now a, a list of some of the practices that TTC is advising its farmers to pursue. So TTC is um, monitoring and documenting changes in the soil organic matter to help provide guidance on fertiliser applications. It's encouraging farmers to rotate um, legumes in their cropping systems. So as well as benefiting the soil biome, that crop diversification um, through the rotation can improve um, pest and disease, disease management, as well as kind of increase yield and incomes. Um, TTC is helping farmers to apply microbial organic fertilizers, and these are produced by the company as a byproduct from its sugar mills, and they account for about 40% of all of the fertilizer that TTC um, supplies to its contract farmers. Um, it's working on integrated pest management solutions to replace synthetic pesticides. So that's also helping to improve soil health. Um, it's advising farmers to avoid burning residue of um, the crop residue. And it's encouraging farmers to engage in return cropping. So the sugar cane itself is maintained for um, up to seven or eight years rather than a standard practice of, of three years. And so that enables farmers to avoid the, the high costs and the risks involved in frequent replanting. And it also helps to support improved soil health. So I thought those examples from a sugar company um, in Vietnam were really interesting um, and, and just a great demonstration of what can be done when there's the right model um, of engagement between a company and, and the farmers. So I'll stop there, James. Great. Thank you very much, Kate. And I mean, it, it is an important issue with any you know circular economy activity is how these um changes how these improvements how these substitutions affect the overall system and it's something that the adb and both its sovereign and its private sector activities look at uh, when considering investments when considering support is not just the target the specific target but also that sort of systems dynamics how it impacts the overall um, the overall value chains and related value chains. Um, and particularly uh, with that crop burning issue we've seen recently um, in India, where you know, very bad levels of air pollution from crop burning. Um, Singapore, as you mentioned, persistent issues with haze from crop burning. And, and, and recently ADB has uh, um, issued a blog, uh, Yoko Watanabe, our environment team director, um, and Yasmin Siddiqui have, have issued a blog, and I think there's a link in the chat there as well. Um, so, you know, very relevant, very current. Um, we have some questions in the chat, and I'm going to pick on this one from uh, Dr. Anna Pitkin. Um, and this is a question that we see a lot with any circular economy substitution. Everybody says, oh, plastics are bad, plastics are this, but, you know, is, are the alternatives any better? Are the alternatives um, actually an improvement in sustainability. So, Pierre, I'm, I'm going to throw this one at you, and I, I, I don't know if you've been following the chat, but yeah, uh, I, I asked um, Anna for, for a bit of clarification. It is very much on, you know, are bioplastics actually better? You know, do, do, do they offer us a, you know, a, a more sustainable solution than the, the fossil-based plastics they replace? Sure, happy to answer this. And I actually know Anna um, from, uh, from previous years. It's good to have you on the webinar, Anna. Um, so I, I see your question and um, I, I think it depends. I, I think it depends on what environmental impacts are we actually trying to reduce? If we just care about greenhouse gas emissions and we don't care about the rest, bioplastics works. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions for, for sure. Um, but you should also have an industrial composting facility. Otherwise, um, the bioplastic will release more methane at the end of life, and that can have more greenhouse gas emissions than petrochemical plastics. Um, you know, I see the question there about, um, you know, have we actually modeled these reductions? So we didn't analyze, uh, we didn't do the next step of the analysis where you actually simulate, oh, what if scenarios of like, oh, if you reduce fertilizer use, um, or if you reduce, if you change to clean energy, uh, just mainly because um, we haven't seen facilities actually implement this um, in terms of the agricultural side. If you reduce fertilizer use, um, that can affect the crop yield. And that's something that you actually have to do real experiments on. Something we did have real data from, which was uh, the end of life, actually. So when we actually analyze um, how does biodegradation affect um, greenhouse gas emissions, there was an interesting study 
where um, a team of researchers, they went out and tested different bioplastics and put them in an industrial composting environment versus a um, just a plain uh, landfill and watched the bioplastic uh, degrade. And they tracked, the, they, ca they measured the amount of greenhouse gas emissions and they had some useful data about how much methane was released versus um, carbon dioxide and such. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, that's, you know, the amount of, uh, that, that's the type of real data we were able to use um, and such from, from this analysis. Um, but in terms of, you know, whether uh, bioplastics are sustainable or not, I think, again, it really depends on what environmental problem you're trying to solve. Um, if it's, if and there's a lot of focus on decarbonization. And so if that's the only thing we're focused on, then bioplastics work, um, so long as you have an industrial composting facility. Um, but for, in terms of other aspects like PM pollution, um, that could be a challenge. I see another question in the box here about how can bioplastics contribute to decarbonization and uh, air quality. Well, hang, hang on, well, hang on, Pierre, before you get into that. Sure. One. Calm down. Sure, sure. Super excited um, here. But I'll so pause. I'll excited. Pause. I, I know you are. I, I'm actually gonna. I'm actually gonna pass that one to um, Kate initially for that comment about the other high end uses. And I mean, one of the things that we've seen with bioplastics is that they are not a panacea. They're not you know, applicable to every situation. As with a lot of sustainability, a lot of waste management, recycling, the, the solutions are niche. Um, is that, you know, where, where do you see, um, Kate, you know, the, those high-end applications, those value-add applications? Are you, are you seeing any of that in your pipeline at the moment? Uh, we have seen some... Uh... I've seen some market research that suggests that there's potential for bioplastics to be used in 3D printing. Um, so, James, I'm not sure if this is kind of the yeah, response. I mean, you know, and, and, any, any wisdom you can share with us? <laughs> I don't know that I have a, a lot of wisdom and I don't have the report at hand, so there's probably not a lot of um, detail that I can share, but I did find that very interesting. Um, and so I think within 3D printing, the intended sort of application that I think is a quite a nascent field was around sort of um, medical applications. Um, and so this is absolutely, yeah, I'm, I'm an agriculture person, so I'm not yeah, going no, to I didn't, that. Mean to on, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I know you, you okay. can have a bit more visibility on some of this. And it, it is an interesting opportunity. I mean, typically bioplastics at the moment are hitting those, you know, refuse bags, carrier bags, you know, some single use plastics, um, you know, in the, in the food industry, but it, it is those sort of higher end, more technical plastics that we hope to see. I mean, certainly I think ADB, we've looked at various applications through the private sector, through sovereign operations on where bioplastics could enter higher, higher end use, but you know, they are solidly looking at the moment at those thin film replacements, which is good because they are principally those, those that are present in our environment, present in our landfills and difficult to recycle. But, uh, you know, certainly some aspiration. And if there are um, people on the webinar today who have, um, you know, information or would like to discuss those aspirations for higher end usage, I'm sure Kate and the rest of our team would be very happy to hear from you. Um, so, Pia, now you've had, managed to get your breath back. Um, the future for PHB and PHA, that's a bit more of a technical question for you. Yeah, well, um, so the future, I mean, I think really in the end, it just becomes, I think the future of any bioplastic um, as, a, as a starter is just whether you can, is it cheaper than petrochemical plastics? As I showed before, the prices of bioplastics are right now quite high compared to uh, oil-based plastics. And so, you know, whether it's PHA or PLA, um, if we're looking at, you know, consumer adoption and purchase, it's really going to come down to the price point. And, um, and right now we see that in Thailand, uh, there's, there hasn't, uh, since there's no promotion or incentives to buy bioplastics, no one's really purchasing them because they come uh, with an added cost and such. Um, and, and reducing those costs is a, a challenge for the industry just because there's a lot of investment in R&D um, and such to make the production process possible. Um, so, you know, that's the most I think I can answer with regard to competitiveness, uh, competitiveness of those residents uh, from a financial standpoint. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, and uh, a question here from Neil. Um, contribute to decarbonization and air quality. So, I mean, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, Kate. Um, is there any more detail that you want to go into on that? 
Um, hi, Neil. Did. Nice to hear from you. <laughs> I remember our, our previous panel participations together. Very nice to have you join today. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. So in terms of decarbonisation, and I think this links into a question that Anna has also posted in the chat around sort of measuring um, the the impact of the climate change of, um, sorry, um, measuring the emissions reductions associated with um, supporting farmers to make changes to their practices. Um, that's a very challenging question in the context of developing um, Asia because of the prevalence of smallholder farmers. Um, so it is a, the, the monitoring um, verification and, sorry, monitoring, reporting and verification, MRV, um, of um, emissions reductions that arise from changes in farming practices is something that will require many smart people to work on to solve. Um, there will need to be some technology solutions, um, but they will need to be ground truth. Um, so it's a it's a very, very complicated question. It's something that we're talking about um, with our private sector agribusiness clients um, extensively, that we will need to find some kind of technology partners that we can work with to support that measuring of emissions reductions from, for instance, when a farmer transitions from, let's say, over application of single nutrient urea at the moment to then a much more precision application of um, not just an NPK, but even the next level of um, targeted nutrition, which might be, you know, secondary and, and tertiary level micronutrients, for instance, that really deliver to the plant's needs no, and no more than that, um, there would absolutely be an emissions reduction associated with that. But how you measure that is very challenging. The other aspect of that is how you may measure um, soil's potential to sequester carbon on a permanent basis. And that is also extremely complicated and it varies according to soil type. Um, it can vary according to climate. Climate shocks like a drought may um, or a flood may change the permanence of um, any carbon that might have been sequestered. So these are all really important and challenging questions and we don't have a perfect answer to them yet. Right. Okay, let me just let me just add on a little bit here. Um, so uh, thank you, Neil, for the question. It's good to see you again. Uh, see you again on this webinar. Um, I, with regards to decarbonization, air pollution, I think the most ideal case of a bioplastic is a bioplastic that uses agricultural waste, um, has low energy in the conversion process, um, and you get this good material mainly because you're preventing the release of you know, particulate matter by using agri-waste, um, but also you, if you have low energy, then that means the bioplastic would likely have lower greenhouse gas emissions than uh, current bioplastics. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, I, I think with bioplastic right now, a lot of them kind of go through traditional chemical processes. But if you actually just go from direct biomaterial to just um, just the actual material without ha with by avoiding those chemical conversion processes, that will significantly reduce the energy consumed uh, required to make uh, that biomaterial. Um, and such. So just to think trying to, you know, if there's a company out there that's thinking out of the box and trying to do this, I think that's where, um, you know, the, the opportunity lies to both reduce carbon emissions, but also particulate matter emissions and uh, address air pollution problems. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kate, thank you, Pierre. And, and just a little bit more on the uh, the comment, on the question from, from Anna um, about, you know, water availability, droughts, floods. And, you know, this, this is something that we're looking at and, and Kate mentioned the regenerative agriculture. Um, you know, and you, you've heard this, this sort of discussion on using crop wastes um, as bioorganic fertilizers or bioorganic so soil improvers. And this is an area that we're starting to look at, not specifically related to bioplastics, but you know, as part of our agricultural development, how we can use that, you know, maintain those nutrients within a circular economy, bring those the, the crop waste back into the plantations um, and look at that climate change adaption. You know, typically work um, on climate change has been around mitigation, reducing the emissions. But as we look to the future, we see these periods of droughts. We need plants with healthier root systems. We need plants with um, more advanced root systems that, that are better able to use the nutrients in the soil. Um, this has a direct impact on you know, reducing nutrient runoff. 
but also overall plant health. The healthier the plant is, the, the better it yields and the um, more successful it, it will, the more successfully it will go through these periods of drought, these periods of hardship. Um, and it, it plays into this, this discussion that we're having about these huge systems. You know, typically when I worked in the, in the climate change industry 10 or 12 years ago, we looked at specific elements of any system. More and more now we're having to look at these investments, at these opportunities, at these policies to consider every aspect of that crop production, every aspect of that material production um, and how we safeguard it and how we manage those trade-offs. You know, as, as you mentioned here, the trade-offs between food supply security and bioplastics production. And certainly I think as, as we, we go through this and based on the work that P has done for us, there is a, a leaning towards trying to use crop residues, trying to use the residues as opposed to taking uh, productive land out of food production into plastic substitution production. Um, yeah, so it's it's an interesting and it's a developing area. As Kate mentioned, it's something we're learning about as we go. We, we were very happy to, to start looking at this with bioplastics. Um, and it has literally opened Pandora's box for us. As, as you notice, you know, there's a lot of the people on this call, P or Kate, working together. Um, and this is as, as ADB works as a team to understand how these different aspects work together. Um, I noticed that Steve Peters, thank you, Steve, has put a couple of links in the chat on higher end uses for bioplastics. So people are you know, thinking about that, I, rightly so. Um, it is a huge opportunity for you know, reduction of fossil fuel based plastics. Um, one thing I'd like you to go a little, more, little bit deeper here, and this is an area of future study that we're, we're just now beginning, is this challenge of bioplastics in the consumer environment? How do we help, you know, ordinary citizens, members of the public work with bioplastics, use bioplastics, but then maintain that segregation as we go into the recycling industry? We have this challenge where bioplastics can disrupt the recycling industry. So just, you know, for a few minutes, some of your thoughts on that, some of the ideas on that. I know Thailand is doing very well leading this process. Sure, James, happy to elaborate more on this. So the, 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 the real answer to this is you need an effective labeling scheme for bioplastic products. Um, and there's a lot of certifications out there in the market, and these are voluntary. You have companies that um, you can apply for a, a standard and get proof that it is biodegradable. But there's so many different types of certifications out there and such, and it, this actually adds more confusion to the consumer. Um, to, to an extreme extent, um, it, um, consumers might think that uh, if it's bioplastic, you can just throw it in their backyard and everything's okay for the environment. Um, but what actually is needed is a, an effective labeling screen, uh, scheme that is ideally uh, managed by a government agency because you need some sort of national standard for this label. Um, you know, in Thailand, Thailand has um, some champions in, in labels. One example is like energy efficiency. So there's a number five label that consumers, when they see it, they instantly know that what the appliance they are buying is gonna be energy efficient. Similarly with bioplastic, we would need some type of labeling scheme and something that's very obvious uh, that can be understood by both um, you know, um, consumers with uh, higher uh, purchasing power, but also um, workers who deal with um, recycling, uh, both the informal and formal sector. So that um, they need to be able to very, very much clearly see um, that this product that's made from bioplastics is made from bioplastics through the label. And that could be, and there's all design and um, human behavior that needs to be studied about this and such. So create this um, really effective label that actually results in the actions uh, desired, which is in this case, um, people for no, to know that it is a bioplastic and it should not be mixed in with traditional waste streams. Great, thank you, Pierre. And, and I'm, I'm going to pick on this um, this this question, this comment from Shantara. Um, and it's not meant it's not I'm not meant to be picking on you, Shantara, but it, it's an interesting one because it's a conversation that we had during the preparation of this report. And I'm, I'm going to ask Pierre to put his his uh, lecturer's cap on. So, Bastard, bioplastics are 100% biodegradable. And I know that we we had this when we wrote the report and we went through the comments. Can you please give us the, de the definition again 
of what we're talking about when we talk about bioplastics, because this issue of biodegradability versus biosourced, it's, you know, it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for all of us. And perhaps, you know, we, we've discussed this, Peter. So put your lecturer's hat sure, on. Sure. Just give us a, Got it. a few minutes. So I'll, I'll, sure, sure thing, James. So I'll go to the definition again. Bioplastics are defined as plastic materials made of substances derived from biomass materials and or can be broken down by microorganisms through processes that occur naturally in the environment or technically enhanced uh, natural processes. Now to answer the, the question about uh, microplastics and the uh, from bioplastics, um, bioplastics also produce microplastics, but they last far less longer than petrochemical plastics, mainly because they are from bio-based materials and they are designed to be biodegradable. Um, and such. Um, I mean, anything you kind of, any any type of object you have will result in some residue, but with bioplastics, um, they will just last uh, far less longer and persist far less longer in the environment compared to petrochemical uh, microplastics. And that's what's really choking up the uh, the aquatic sea life, you know, just the microplastics, because they persist much longer um, in organisms and, uh, and in plants. Great, Peter. Thank you very much. So it, it is something, it's something that we as, as a team tripped over, um, but it is something we have to be very, very clear about when we discuss bioplastics is, is whether we are talking about plastics that are biodegradable or plastics that are created from a, a organic source or some organic feedstock. Um, the two are not mutually exclusive, but there are some, as with bio-based PET, that are sourced from an organic feedstock, but are not necessarily biodegradable. Um, so just, you know, for, for everybody on the call, as this discussion develops, um, as we move forward, it is something to be very clear in your mind when you ask about or talk about bioplastics is, you know, which, which bit you are talking about. Um, we've got a question here from David Allen um, about bioplastic. So this would be hard plastics, Pierre, um, as mm. opposed to the thin film, bioplastics for crates, um, growing insects but it, you know a, a wider question on hard plastics a lot of what we've talked about today are thin film plastics you know plastic bags are we seeing bioplastics being used for those harder plastics sort of the hdpe abs replacements um mm. you know thoughts on that sure um there are yeah so the the bio when we did this study it was really focused on the disposable um applications for the different bioplastics but there are there are examples of bio-based materials using to replace hard plastics like hdp and such and what you know what i've seen from interactions with different companies is that um they're actually using more uh agricultural residue they're mixing the residue with the um petrochemical plastic so it might be like half uh, oil-based PET, and then the other half is agricultural residue that's been treated and mechanically um, converted into a material that actually ha creates these properties for durability. And so, um, you know, one example are like uh, pet food bowls. Those are not meant to be disposed right away. You're supposed to be used for a longer time. Um, replacement for pottery uh, containers. So that's an example of using uh, bioplastics for durables. Um, but again, this is more of bringing in um, the agricultural residues and stuff. Um, and it has to do with just how, what's your intention in making this bio-based material? Are you designing, are, are you making a material designed to last or just for quick, you know, rapid consumption and disposal? Um, so there are solutions out there that people are using, um, using bioplastics for, but it might come more, come, come more from the actual um, biomaterial as opposed to going through some sort of chemical conversion process. Yeah, so I mean, crop wastes we, we see from, from the palm oil industry, from the cassava industry, um, from the um, sugar cane, a lot of lignin remaining in the bio waste. And I think it's those lignin fibers yep. which you're talking about, which, which are being sep you know, industrially separated um, and introduced into the plastics. And also um, water hyacinth, which is not a, a wide mm. material, but is, is a massive invasive species within the um the tropics causes a lot of problems in, in in certainly in thailand um in malaysia in the philippines as well if, if you sit in bangkok by the river as i've been fortunate to do on once one or two occasions you, you see huge rafts of water hyacinth floating by um, and these are plants which which have a, a serious impact on the health of freshwater bodies but also block flood control measures 
um, block, you know, um, accumulate heavy metals. They are a problematic plant within the tropics, but the fibers within them are, are very suitable for use in you know, reinforcement of plastics, reinforcement of bioplastics. So, you know, there, there, there are opportunities there, David, but, you know, I don't think, and unless Kate has seen projects on hard plastics using bio as fillers, no, I don't I think- I haven't, no. <laughs> I don't think we can help you with a specific manufacturer, but certainly um, if, if anybody else on the webinar has that information, you know, please share it with David. Um, if anything comes up in the future, we'll be happy to, to discuss that with you. Um, we're coming down to the last five minutes of the webinar. Any final questions from participants? Any final questions coming from our audience? I think we've we've covered a, a huge range of um, you know, the bioplastics. We're very grateful for Peer for all his hard work. I think the the you know the challenge, the underlying challenge we see is this issue of, of substitution and sustainability of substitution. And particularly for bioplastics, that interaction with food supply security and um, you know the overall land use, particularly as we 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 move into a you know a future with more environmental challenges. Um, can I just ask on that case, as we don't seem to have any more questions, is Kate some just some some final thoughts, perhaps on you know private sectors look at this and you know where, where the future is what could the audience look for in the future in terms of private sector opportunities interesting emergent areas within the bioplastics so you know wider agriculture um well within bioplastics i mean this is really the the area of expertise of, of peer and I, I probably don't want to comment too much on um you know other than what i've read in some um sort of industry reports you know, I mentioned earlier the um you know the higher end applications um you know for medical uses I think potentially some um finding ways to blend um, bioplastics um seems to be quite um compelling if it's if it's able to solve some of these challenges um end of life challenges that um that peers talked about I think um there could be you know a lot of application or a lot of upside for um for those applications. Um, on the agriculture side, I guess I, I would just mention sort of what we're doing in um, in ADB's private sector agribusiness investment activity. So we are working with our clients um, that are using kind of contracts, uh, these sustainable contract farming models. I, I think I mentioned that that's um, the model that, that TTC uses with sugarcane farmers in Vietnam, and that's a model that we see often um, with our clients in, in developing countries in Asia. So we can provide them with loans for working capital so that they can fund the advances to farmers. And we can also provide um, loans for CapEx that might be required for um, farm machinery or production facilities for biofertilizer or for, Neil has mentioned, biochar as well, which we very strongly support. Um, or maybe for investments in, in drip irrigation or agroforestry, or if it's something like cocoa or coffee, which is not relevant for bioplastics, but for agri in general, um, replanting of, of say aged trees that are no longer as productive um, as they were at the earlier stages of their life. Um, and there are now um, you know, hybrids that are much more productive and also much more resilient to climate change. So finding ways to support the companies that then have farmers in their networks to um, to replant their trees is something that we're looking at. Um, and then just wherever we can, we aim to mobilise a, um, a grant-based technical assistance to the farmers that are in the networks of our clients. So that's a capacity-building TA that um, provides training in, in climate-smart agriculture, functional financial literacy, um, and it would typically augment a company's existing activities. So that's some of the things, there's some of the things that we're working on um, within within our team to try to help um, agriculture in in Asia become more sustainable. Great, thank you very much. And Pierre, last just the last minute, final thoughts, close out, promote sure. your, your upcoming work and webinars. Sure, sure. Um, no, I, I I think bioplastic is a complex topic, and I think the big achievement from this study is actually drawing a baseline because there's a lot of scattered knowledge out there and different perspectives. And we were able to really pull all that together through facts and data and analysis. 
And I think the key thing is that a lot of, I mean, Thailand invests in bioplatforms because they have the resources um, and that you, know, you have to run an economy and fuel um, the nation. And so I think looking ahead, um, it's more just about how do we just make it more sustainable. Um, bioplastics are here, they are not going away, and I don't think a ban is necessarily going to solve it. So how do we just make this industry better, solve more problems, and create less problems and stuff? And this is, um, and so it's been great to actually explore these cross-cutting issues through this study from agriculture, uh, ocean pollution, manufacturing, and such. And so now we have a much more clearer path of what to do to make the industry better and actually benefit uh, environment and society. Excellent, Pia, thank you very much. And you have an upcoming webinar next week on uh, decarbonizing the plastics value chain. There is a link in the chat, thank you, Brian. So um, more information there. Thank you very much, Pia, thank you very much, Kate. Um, a wonderful webinar, well received, excellent questions from the audience. Uh, we are at the top of the hour and we like to finish punctually so everybody can get on. Um, Thank you very much, everybody. I wish you a good day and look forward to seeing you all again on our next webinar. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Take care.